Thanks very much. I, I'm hearing some common themes in these talks, um, particularly about the need for doing. Uh, my, my talk today, as you can see a little bit from the, from the title, is there's a lot written, there's a lot uh, spoken about delivering sustainable cities, but much less is actually done. What we've seen uh, in the presentation so far is they're the exceptions rather than the rule. And we're all kind of grasping, I think, for uh, what's the answer? How do, we, how do we actually make this happen? Um, I, my starting point is, well, what's the problem? Um, and I think the problem is that markets and governments fail. We see markets failing all around us, and yet we, we kind of, we've kind of been brought up, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, to think that markets are somehow perfect. It's something to do, I think, with probably a combination of the Victorian era and the Cold War. You know, we couldn't say there was anything wrong with markets. But look around you. Look at the banking crisis. A market failure of the most enormous proportions. There's people being thrown out of work in my country who had absolutely nothing to do with banking because of the banking crisis that started in the States. That's market failure. It's also government failure because the regulators failed to control that process. Uh, Nick Stern described climate change as the biggest ever market failure. It's also a government failure because year after year, governments around the world are unable to get their acts together to do anything about it. In city making, look at things like out-of-town retail. Out-of-town retail destroys the high streets that we as individual citizens uh, really value. That's the market failing to produce the appropriate kind of social outcome and it's the failure of the planners to do anything about it. So markets and governments fail, what are we going to do about it? Well, I'm kind of into revolution, I think, um, and a people's revolution. I was really struck by some of the things we've, we've heard so far. There's immense power in people, but in people that come together as part of a common process. And the story I'm hopefully going to tell tonight is a little bit about a group of people and the circumstances in which we came together and we created a process of producing sustainable cities as, as uh, I think we should call them gill number one and gill number two, as, as I think gill number one said um, earlier on, you know, street by street, neighbourhood by neighbourhood. If you do it like that, eventually you transform a city. Small changes, lots of people big transformation. Um, so this, and I do see this as a war. I see this as a war against greed, um, against bankers. I think the financiers have got a lot of guilt in this process. And I don't know how this will play, but I, I, I see this as a war against the kind of troops of the Jeremy Clarkson movement. Does that mean anything to you guys? Yeah, okay, the petrol head from the UK that we really wish he'd move somewhere else. Um, <laughs> So this is my starting point. Um, this is Albert Dock in Liverpool in the northwest of England. Uh, when I arrived there in the 80s, uh, it was 1.2 million square feet of derelict heritage building. Uh, there was no water in that dock. That was completely mud. There was pigeons. There was moss growing in the buildings. It was a bit of a disaster zone. It was great. What a wonderful place to start. Um, brought up in the northwest of England, we had the Industrial Revolution before anybody else, very proud of that. Um, we had de-industrialization before anyone else, not quite so proud of that. Um, but we got to do regeneration before anyone else. Uh, so we've been doing it for a while. In fact, we kicked it off with some really good riots in the early 80s. Um, and that was, that was part of why Albert Dock uh, came into being. And we're still doing it. I was talking to Peter, who you're going to be hearing from uh, in a moment. Um, about a biker in Newcastle, and this is a site in Usburn. It's a derelict former manufacturing, former Industrial Revolution manufacturing site on the edge of the city centre in Newcastle in North East England. This is, this is the igloo kind of project. This is what we do. We've been going about 10 years, invented by um, a very far-sighted guy called Phil Clark at uh, Aviva, a, a global investment house, and he saw there was an opportunity um, to get good returns from investing in places like this because nobody else was investing here. 
It turns out that we were the first. So the United Nations called us the world's first responsible real estate fund. Um, but I'm, as you can tell by my age, a bit of a, an ageing punk rocker. So I was actually more excited when Monocle called us the top five global developer. That was really cool. Um, so this is the important bit. This is a process. So what we did when we started uh, 10 years or so ago is we kind of, we tried to think about all the things that we'd need to do to make cities better places. Um, starting from the project, moving into the neighbourhood, and then hopefully moving up to the city level. And we wrote them all down. And it took a while. Um, and most people thought we were completely mad. So it seems obvious now that we were saying it's really important to cut down on, on energy use and carbon emissions. Um, but I tell you, the real estate market in the UK 10 years ago thought that was complete madness. I did a presentation to a major US-based investor, and I got to the bit on sustainability. And this was our competitive advantage. This was our strategy. This was what we were about. And he said, no, I'm not interested in that. Move on. Um, so that's, that's how far the, uh, the, the, the market has, has changed now. And, and if I'm honest, we've been caught up on environmental sustainability. But we haven't been caught up on design. We haven't been caught up on social progress. And when a few years ago we introduced the idea that when you're building cities, you need to think about the health, happiness, and well-being of the community, the real estate industry in the UK again thought we were completely mad. We had quite a battle with some of the money men around whether this was an appropriate thing for a, an investment company to be talking about. And one of the things we did as we were building this process was we found ourselves some allies, and, and Gill number two, I think, was talking about the importance of alliances, and absolutely right. So these were our initial allies, Jonathan Porritt, who's, um, who actually I found out the other day, whose great-grandfather or something was Governor-General of New Zealand. Didn't go down well when I mentioned that when I was in, in Auckland. Um, uh, he was the chair of the UK Government Sustainable Development Commission, um, we had one of the UK's top architects, George Ferguson, a really clever professor of social policy and power from London School of Economics, and Paul King, who was then with WWF and, and now is the chief exec of the UK Green Buildings Council. It's really important to get your allies around you, to get their networks of support to help you achieve this. We had a business model, and one of the things that we're trying to do in... Um, kind of subverting the way the mainstream industry works is to use the levers of the markets and to use the levers of government. So we identified that investing in the most deprived areas in the UK actually produced the same returns as investing in the mainstream prime central business districts. That came as quite a, quite a shock to the investment community when, when they discovered that. And then there was a further piece of research done by three universities, Aberdeen, Ulster and Dundee in the UK, which said that if you invested alongside government in regenerating some of those deprived communities, then you'd get a 20% outperformance. So that was the kind of basic building block of our, of our process. And we also scanned the horizon. So we were looking for the changes that were going to be coming in the future. It's kind of easier in, in Europe because it takes a while for European legislation to get down to local level. But that's where most of it comes from. So we were able to look at that. And, and we also relied heavily on some of the great thinkers. Jane Jacobs, uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities. Just a, a quick poll, actually. Who's, who's read it? How many people in the audience have read it? What a great book, isn't it? Those people who didn't put their hands up, get out there, buy a copy, it's fantastic. And this isn't because Gill Number 2 is in the room, but Jan Gale as well from Copenhagen, and we saw some of his work earlier. I mean, he's just a complete genius on, on, on making cities. So I just want to run through a few examples of things that we've seen that we think are good, things that we've done, um, things that I think, if we get a process together, and our process now, actually we could throw away the manual because the people who operate it are improving it each day in, in the projects they do. They don't need the manual anymore. They, they're just thinking in terms of producing sustainable cities. The examples may not work in Melbourne. They may not work in Australia. They're, they're very kind of local social market context, but see if there's anything that you like. We've already heard something about communities. We've, we've coined a phrase, um, members of local communities are locality experts. We wouldn't think of building a building without an architect. 
We wouldn't think of building a neighborhood without a locality expert. Really, really important people. You start with them. You don't do the top-down thing. It's not governments. It's not developers telling communities. It's communities telling developers and governments. Um, we did that. Community said to us, this is in a, despite the river and the trees, this is one of the tougher areas of Nottingham in the English Midlands. Community said, we just need ordinary terrace houses. That's what we want. So we produced ordinary terrace. We made them quite nice, ordinary terrace houses. But we produced ordinary terrace houses because that, that was what the community said they needed. Um, this is in, in Holland. This is a, uh, both a great story and a sad story. So uh, built by the Dutch Building Industries Pension Fund, uh, urban designer, a guy called Seward Soiters, and he persuaded his client that he had to cut these canals across this old derelict wharf about 15 minutes out of the city centre. Um, that completely bust the budget, and his client, the project manager, got sacked, which is pretty sad. Um, the scheme was their second best performing investment ever because the value that was produced by this urban design way outstripped the, uh, the increased costs. So we need, to, we need to turn the industry uh, ethos around from being cost-driven to being value-driven. Um, we had a, there was, this is a bit like the Gill number no. one park bench story. So this is Poundbury on the edge of Dorchester, developed by Prince Charles. Um, urban design by Leon Creer. And the brilliant move here is that there's a nine inch gap between the back of the pavement and the front of the building. And that allows this lady to grow roses. And that means that she has to get her stepladder out and prune her roses periodically. And that means she gets to speak to her neighbors when she's doing her pruning. And that gets community glue, those weak contacts that we now know from the science are so important to happiness. So some really important kind of tiny little things that were all part of the Poundbury process. This is our scheme in, in London, in Bermondsey Square, and all sorts of little things that the team kind of put together here. They, um, they persuaded all the occupiers to contribute money to a community fund. It's only very small amounts. It's about 40,000 a year. And they, they got together with the existing community in the area formed a little committee and give out small grants to local sports clubs, the local choral society, things like that. Really, really important. Those are the bits of money that are really hard to get. Um, on the right-hand side, there's, um, it's the back of a supermarket. You wouldn't know because it looks like a gallery. They set the uh, back of the, the breeze block wall back, put in a window, create a gallery. No people can go in it, but it's, it's curated. Um, Two local residents have opening nights. It gets listed in listings magazines. It adds fantastically to the place. That's a, a farmer's market going on there every Saturday. As a result, the railway arches have been populated by food retailers. Um, we've lost some battles on this one. We tried to stop selling apartments to buy-to-let landlords. Um, the money men weren't keen on that because they said that cut out half our market. Um, but we actually managed to, uh, to sell about 95% to owner-occupiers because we felt community is important. And, and owner-occupiers have more of a stake than people who uh, are letting for maybe six months at a time and, and you're getting a lot of turnover of tenants. Um, and my final example um, is from Sweden, um, where Cathy comes from. This is way further south. This is Malmo. Uh, and if you're ever in Europe and you're interested in this subject area, and you only have one place to go, go to the Western Harbour in Malmo. Fantastic urban design, fantastic sustainability, fantastic water management in particular. You can see the, the lakes there. This is a beautifully designed little surface drainage system. Um, but more importantly, and I guess this reflects some of the earlier presentations as well, on a summer weekend, you get 10,000 naked Swedes out on, on the front. What's not to like? Um, so none of these things were done by markets. They were done by individuals. This is Banksy. I know you're into your urban art here in Melbourne, so are we in London. This is, this is our top urban artist, Banksy. Individuals with allies, with alliances, with processes, um, doing small things, but doing lots of aligned small things, doing them together. We can do it. We can do it because it can be done. 
it must be done, and I think I'll grab Gill's phrase, we can do it a street at a time, a neighbourhood at a time, and we can do the whole city. Thank you very much.